uh, his leadership on in so many different roles all of that was working against the prosecution was it not it was but it shows that ultimately the truth comes out Alex, it's very good of you to be here. Uh, uh, Alex Little, who is a former assistant federal prosecutor himself. We're working to, th the proceedings inside the court have to end and the judge has to release people from that courtroom before people can begin coming out and explaining the stories of the day. It'll be fascinating to know if we're able to hear from these jurors. History would say they might go through a, a uh, penalty phase before that sort of thing would happen, but you can bet We'll hear from prosecutors this afternoon. Uh, going into this, there are so many legal minds who said this is an extremely tall order for prosecutors. Actually getting a conviction here, what was said to have been by most of the legal analysts with whom we spoke, a, a very difficult process ahead. But now it has happened this Thursday afternoon. Bill Cosby, guilty on all counts. It's 2 o'clock on the East Coast, 11 a.m. on the West Coast. I'm Shepard Smith in New York on Fox television stations across the nation and the Fox News Channel on satellite and cable with the stunning news that Bill Cosby has been found guilty of sexual assault, three second-degree felonies. He faces the possibility of up to 30 years in prison for his crimes. Joining us now is Jeffrey Kramer, former federal prosecutor, and on the line with us. Jeffrey, your reaction? Well, certainly uh, a little surprised when you uh, prosecutors rack up a case for a second time, as has been indicated, um, it becomes more difficult because witnesses are already on record with their prior statements. Therefore, the cross-examinations become more robust. However, uh, prosecutors also learn from their mistakes. You know, they have a chance to hear from the jurors in the first time to see what worked and what didn't work so they can refine their presentation. And that's clearly what happened here. But it's still, these are difficult cases, whether it's the first time or second time through. He, he has always been one who captivated audiences in ways unparalleled uh, in, in, in so many ways that, that Bill Cosby, the persona, has gone down in this way is notable uh, in this area of women's empowerment. It, it certainly is. And, you know, we've seen it be it in federal court or, or state court, as this was, uh, well-known individuals uh, brought up on, uh, on criminal charges. However, this one is certainly unique, uh, given his stature going back 20, 30 years. Um, and that's, that's what makes it uh, difficult uh, for prosecutors. However, I have to say that uh, jurors can set that aside. The notoriety are, are famous of them. Of course, of course. Jeffrey Kramer, thank you. Stay with us. I want to return our, our, our local viewers on Fox television stations and my, my stations across the nation as our coverage continues on Fox News Channel on satellite and cable of the guilty verdict of Bill Cosby. I'm Shepard Smith, Fox News, New York. And continuing now on Fox News Channel, we're waiting to go back to the courtroom where we've had a, a long-term producer, Lisa Kaplan, who's covered really more trials than I can even count at this moment over the past 10 or 20 years for us. And she was in the courtroom there and sent these interesting to me dispatches regarding what, what was happening in the courtroom as this, as this went down. And I can't wait to hear from her about it. The six alternates led into the courtroom A, sat in the back row of that courtroom before the announcement of all of this. Lissa Kaplan observed that while they were waiting for the jury and the judge to enter, remember, the jury sends a note saying we've reached a verdict. And then all of the players have to get into the courtroom to hear that verdict read, used often by the court reporter, uh, once the judge is in place and all the rest. Well, Bill Cosby got back into that courtroom before all the rest of the players. And while they were waiting, she says, Cosby was sitting quietly at the defense table and it looked to her as if his eyes were closed. Imagine this moment after all of these months and years, knowing that he had once admitted that he obtained quaaludes to give to women, uh, knowing that his, his life is truly on the line here, a man of his age with 30 years prison sentence, if it comes to that. Again, we don't have the penalty phase yet, but that was the possibility. Uh, the thought of that for Bill Cosby must have been weighing mighty heavily. And then think on the other side, Andrea Constand, who had worked so tirelessly uh, as, as the one of all of the accusers whose case did not fall, who fell within the statute of limitations. So many others had made claims against Bill Cosby of this pattern of sexual abuse, of drugging women, and then taking advantage of them, and then lying about it. It was Andrea Constand who was left to carry the torch of justice 
for the rest of these women. And today, a jury of his peers, a jury of Bill Cosby's peers, found that he was guilty on all charges. Jeffrey Kramer with us once again, a former federal prosecutor. You know, Jeffrey, normally you don't hear... These same jurors will be involved in the penalty phase, right? Well, the judge uh, dictates, uh, dictates that, so the, the testimony will be before the court itself. And, that, and that'll be victim impact statements and, and more? Uh, Exactly. Uh, you know, the prosecutors can make an argument. Obviously, defense lawyers will as well. And both sides can bring in what they deem relevant evidence. Part of that is certainly going to be uh, victim impact statements, uh, which victims themselves can read. Uh, prosecutors can, can read it if the victims don't want to do it. But that will get very emotional in this kind of case. And in this particular case, the, at some point, it could be happening right now, the judge will thank these jurors in many different ways the sacrifice that jurors make in the, in the, in the pursuit of justice is sometimes a, a great one. And these certainly having been sequestered, though not for very long, uh, ha have given quite a lot in, in service of their fellow men and women in Philadelphia and really for that matter across the nation. Uh, Jeffrey, this afternoon it's possible that we would hear from them and we could learn on what facts this thing turned for them. Uh, we might. Uh, in my experience, some jurors, especially after a case like this, want to get out the back door and not talk to anybody for a while. Uh, however, uh, sometimes you see a few jurors get together to make a statement representing the whole. Not sure what we'll see here, but at some point, there's no doubt, uh, we will hear from uh, some of the jurors who will give us uh, uh, some idea of what tipped it. Uh, there's no doubt this jury took their role seriously. They asked for readback on a pivotal testimony from Jackson, um, and clearly that, uh, that was enough to put them over the edge. And, and that pivotal testimony for our viewers, could you give them an idea of what that was about? Sure. In, in, a, in a nutshell, the, the victim, Constant, um, talked to Jackson, who was a friend of hers at Temple University. Uh, and according to Jackson, this is the testimony, uh, Constant, the victim, said that, uh, you know, accusing individuals of sexual abuse and sexual assault is a way to get some money from a civil suit. So that's pivotal with respect to a bias. So Jackson, you know, the friend who heard this, went through a, a fairly withering cross-examination from the prosecutors. The jurors wanted to hear from Jackson, again, the victim friend um, and whatever uh, problems there were in the jury regarding that testimony uh, clearly the readback helped um, and constant again the victim here um, her testimony clearly ruled the day uh, uh, the judge has now as I mentioned thanked the jury and we have details of that uh, the judge is judge Stephen T O'Neill in Montgomery County there in in Pennsylvania and uh, quoting Judge O'Neill, this has been an extraordinarily difficult case, he told uh, these men and women of Montgomery County. Going on with the quote, you have sacrificed much, sacrificed much, but you have sacrificed it in service to this country, this county, and this town. And that is important. And from the some some color from inside the courtroom that's come to us from other courtrooms of courtroom observers a range of reaction to the verdict says Laura Benshoff who's reporting inside the courtroom from from the women who say Cosby drugged and assaulted them uh, Lily Bernard is one of them uh, appeared on the Cosby show back in the day began crying Andrea Constan the victim of of Bill Cosby in this case who who claims led to the first charges uh, appeared serene in the courtroom to those who were watching. Uh, a little bit more that were coming from, from National Public Radio, uh, Bill Cosby convicted. The incident took place in 2004. The settlement with the accuser reached in 2006. Then nine years later, Bill Cosby was charged in criminal court. Then in 2017, a mistrial was declared in that first trial, you remember, a hung jury. And then today, Cosby found guilty. Three counts of aggravated indecent assault, faces up to 10 years on each count, and a $25,000 fine on each count. From Bobby Allen, uh, who is an NPR reporter, Cosby's accuser had to be escorted out of the court, with Lily Bernard, that accuser had to be escorted out of the court after it was announced that Cosby was guilty since she was so overcome with emotion. Cosby himself, according to multiple observers inside the courtroom, and again, I hope to hear from our Alyssa Kaplan shortly, Cosby stayed nearly emotionless. A, jur a, a journalist from NPR, again, that came to us uh, from Bobby Allen. Uh, Jeffrey Kramer, it, is there a precedent in this case? 
Uh, not with respect to the notoriety of the defendant and the allegations. Obviously, uh, sexual abuse cases, unfortunately, uh, happen far too often. Uh, so that those are pretty normal. And the average conviction rate, if you look at it for state prosecutors, is about 70 percent. That gets lowered in these kind of cases uh, because it's usually he said, she said, there's not much physical evidence. So the case themselves, the type of evidence, the type of testimony is fairly common. The type of defendant in this case is obviously uh, highly unique. Our viewers are certainly seeing as the courtroom has begun to empty, clearly the judge has released the players inside the courtroom. It would be common, though I, had, I didn't hear it today because cameras are not allowed inside the courtroom here in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Again, this is Morristown, Pennsylvania. But often the judge will tell the jurors, you do what you want. And then there's Andrea Constan there. Uh, Jeffrey, to think what victims go through in the in the pursuit of justice, it is a very difficult, harrowing, drawn out ordeal. Uh, there's, there's no doubt these kind of cases where the victims uh, suffered a personal injury, unlike a, a monetary case or, or something along those lines, or an eyewitness to a crime, it doesn't get more personal than this, and that's why emotions in these kind of cases um, are difficult. Defense lawyers, and they absolutely did it here, went at these victims uh, pretty hard, as, as is their job. Um, and I think prosecutors did a very good job in marshalling uh, the testimony here and the evidence because there wasn't a lot. There was no DNA. There was no physical evidence. Uh, there, there, it was clearly a he said and she said, plus a bunch of corroborating statements from others who said that they had suffered similar fates. And whether or not to allow that testimony, that was up to the judge, wasn't it? Exactly, and, and that was crucial. Without those extra victims, if you will, I think this is a different verdict. Um, and the court has to balance it. Those charges, those v other victims were prior to the statute of limitations running. So uh, you need to balance, and what's the judge balance is a pattern of the defendant committing these crimes versus not having too many people that are not in the indictment testify against the defendant. But you, you put your, your finger on it. If it's one person testifying, that's a hard case for a jury uh, to wrap around. Once you start hearing the same story from two victims, four victims, five victims, at that point it's easier for the jury to believe the key victim and hear Constan um, that what she says happened indeed did happen. We've just gotten some extraordinary reporting, Jeffrey Kramer, out of the courtroom regarding an outburst that has happened just before this court uh, released the players, released the jurors, allowed everyone who had been inside the courtroom to leave. An extraordinary outburst has just been reported. Remember, there is the question in this case of bail. Bill Cosby has been free on bail during the course of this trial. Now, Bill Cosby has been found guilty, guilty on all charges. So I, I have just gotten word from multiple reporters inside, and there was a question about whether he should be he should be held without bail if he should be incarcerated. I've been mentioning that our Lissa Kaplan is the, is the producer who's been covering this trial for us inside the courtroom. And Lissa, I understand you were witness to this extraordinary outburst that I'm told began with a, with a plea to have Cosby locked up. Can you tell us what happened from there? Sure. After the after the decision was announced by the jury, um, the judge asked if there was any further business and stated that Cosby was still being held on bail. And the district attorney stood up and asked, you know, for that bail to be revoked, saying that it wasn't enough. Quoted the civil settlement to Andrea Constant and saying, you know, he said that three point the, that over three million dollars was a paltry sum to Cosby. He has all this wealth. He has a private plane. At which point, Cosby basically stood up and said, I don't have a plane. Um, and the judge said back to Steele that Cosby had been here for over two and a half years, had never missed a court date, and there was no reason to believe that he would not show up for a bit for, for his sentencing. So the judge told the DA, you know, if he could provide the actual proof, that they could reconsider it. Well, uh, Lissa, don't go anywhere. Uh, Lissa Kaplan, I've known for a couple of decades, and she's not one to be an expletive laden person. And, and she wasn't there, and for that I'm, I'm appreciative. But I do want to give our viewers an idea of what, a further idea of what just happened without making Lissa do it. The district attorney was the one asking Bill Cosby's bail be revoked. He's like, look, he has a private plane, he has great wealth, he could get away. 
And then Bill Cosby stood, or Bill Cosby screamed, he doesn't have a private plane, you rear end of that nature. Screaming at the district attorney, Bill Cosby screaming at the district attorney in court and calling him an expletive, which I should not say on television at 2.15 at in the afternoon, and I won't, but it's an easy Google if you want it. The long and short of it is, Alyssa, this man who had been so stoic, whose eyes were closed as the dispatch you sent us prior to this hearing, who, who had been uh, so quiet and so demure, exploded in the courtroom after this happened. He did. He didn't, you know, he didn't make any other emotion from that. It looked the man who, his PR man, had been leading him in and out of court every day. Um, he's legally blind, and it looked like Andrew Wyatt went to put on kind of hand on him to tell him to calm down, and it looked like he said, like, get away from me or something to that effect. He looked visibly upset, um, but other than that one out outburst, he didn't say anything. He, like you mentioned, he was sitting kind of in his chair with his eyes closed, almost looked like he might have been meditating. At one point, he was leaning back, and that was the only time he kind of he kind of jumped up and, and had his outburst. And he then he was quiet the rest of the time. Did he stand or did he just scream it from his chair? He, he, he you know, I, I, I wasn't watching him when, uh -huh. when he actually said it, but as soon as he did, I noticed he was standing, all the rest of his lawyers were standing. Um, and he stood until basically the judge dismissed him. And at that point, all the media ran out of the courtroom to try and get outside. Andrea Constant, his victim who brought these charges, is in court. Well, the state, of course, brings the charges, but she was the victim in this case. She was in the courtroom. Others who say they were victims of Bill Cosby were in the courtroom. I'm trying to get a picture together of what it was like when all the jurors came in, the judge is in his, is in his place, and then Bill Cosby is in his, the two, the two tables with counselors on both sides are there. And then do they have the foreperson read the verdict or does the court reporter read the verdict? Mm -hmm. The, the four person read the verdict. Um, the, the, the court reporter asked them what, what their verdict was, and, they, and the four person said guilty. Then each juror was told to ask if they agreed with the, the verdict as the four person read it, and they all answered and affirmed that they agreed with it. Andrea Compton was sitting in the front row behind the, behind the, uh, the Commonwealth uh, defense lawyer, or by, I'm sorry, behind the district attorney. She, looked, she was looking ahead. She wasn't. She didn't appear to show any reaction. A couple of rows behind me was um, a few of Cosby's accusers who were visibly upset. One of them was sobbing. You could hear her, and they escorted her out of the courtroom after the after the guilty verdict was read. This this morning, Lissa, the jurors asked for a specific part of the testimony to be read back. Tell us about that and what it meant. They asked to hear back the entire testimony of Margot Jackson, and Margot Jackson is a Temple employee who, who worked with Andrea Compton and said she roomed with her on the road when Andrea, you know, was the director of operations for the Temple basketball team. And she said that during during her, she said that during one of those meetings they were watching a news show, and a report came on about um, a, a, an accusation against someone famous, and Andrea said. You know, I can, that happened to me, and Margot Jackson said she questioned her a couple of times, and finally Andrea said, well, no, it didn't happen to me, but I can make it up and get a lot of money and go to school and start a business. So they wanted to hear, we, you know, we don't know exactly what they wanted to hear, but they read the entire testimony. Um, they wanted, they heard part of different statements Margot Jackson made, um, and they spent the whole time, the court reporter read that back into the record. Right, you don't replay video or audio of such things. Correct. The court reporter reads back what the court reporter presented uh, as the transcript of the court proceedings. And, and after that, I presume, Lisa, they went back into deliberation. Yes, they did. And then we didn't hear anything until we got kind of, you know, there was some rumors by some of the press that there was rumblings that they saw, they saw the, uh, the attorneys walking around and we were told there's not a note. Um, and what they have set up here is the press kind of just get, there's an app, and we, we get a kind of a push notification saying the court will reconvene at whatever time. And it has been saying up until this point, the court is reconvening at so-and-so a time, the jury has a question. And we had been told that we would get a push alert when there was a verdict saying there is a verdict. And we didn't in this case. It just says the court will reconvene at 1.30, and that's all it says. So we knew something was happening. We didn't know what it was. 
And there has been a very, very strict decorum order in this courthouse for every proceeding involving this case where we're not allowed to have our phones out. They're not even, they can be in our bags. They have to be shut off completely. We're not allowed to have our Wi-Fi on. We're not allowed to email anything other than basically take notes. Um, and they had told us that once a verdict was reached, they would make a one-time exception to that decorum order to let us all blast out kind of an email quickly or a quick text saying what that verdict was. So we kind of had a feeling when we were let into court and they reminded us about that, that it was something. Mm. Well, Other than just a... I, it, it, no, not at all. It had to have been, I, Alyssa, I, I was telling our audience that you've been covering, uh, covering courtroom proceedings for our network for, for many years, even decades. And I just wonder if having gone through the, or at least witnessed from afar, the, the, the previous trial in which there was a hung jury and they decided we're going to come back and try this again and having sat through all of this, when you saw those jurors today, did, did it appear that they had felt the burden of this of this very important human endeavor in the American experience that they had, that they, that they realized uh, and, and took to heart what, it, what an important task this was. Brian, I think they were definitely taking it serious. Um, you know, yesterday at one point they had asked for a number, they had asked for a number of things and the judge had told them, I can't give you answers to those questions. And at mm -hmm. one point they wrote a note back saying, are we asking for things correctly? Are we doing this right? And the judge basically said, yeah, you're, whatever you are doing, Whatever you ask for and however you're asking questions, you're doing it right. So I think they really wanted to make sure they were doing it right and and doing what they were supposed to do. You yeah. know, they worked until 9.30 last night. So they worked from around 9 a.m. till 9.30 p.m. last night, wanted to get it done, have, from what we were being told, have been working through lunch. So it really seems like they were taking it seriously. Remember, they've been sequestered since the start of this trial, which means they're staying in a hotel room here. They're, they're allowed to make brief calls to their family, but they're not allowed to talk about the case. They're not allowed to talk about much. Um, as we understand it, they've had brief visits on the weekends with their families, but, but they've been sequestered. They haven't been able to really watch TV or kind of participate in their lives. So they, they were very serious. They were taking that seriously. You don't take that oath to, to, to kind of sit on this jury without knowing how serious and it's going to be and what a commitment it is. Here's the scene outside the courthouse now. We've just been able to get a clear shot of this. And I, we saw members of the prosecution's team and friends of the victims come out raising their hands in the air. Uh, we're expecting that attorneys may speak at any moment. It appears that there's a little bit of a gaggle happening there now, but they'll come in just a short period of time to the microphones we've been led to believe. Of course, there's Gloria Allred. Uh, d d where is Bill Cosby now? And, and what has he left? Does he go home now? As he still has bail? Um, my understanding is he was going to meet, I don't know if it was with the judge or with the clerk or who exactly he has to meet with, but he has to assure them that, they, that his passport has been turned over and that he's going to stay at his primary residence here in the area. You know, I mean, one of the questions was he has so many residents and on his bail form, um, this, this home in this area is listed. So they want to so they want to make sure he's going to stay here and not leave unless he has the permission of the court. So I think they're working through some of those issues right now. Lissa Kaplan, our producer inside the courtroom. Lissa, can't thank you enough for your perspective. Uh, appreciate you being here. I want to let our viewers know as we see this, uh, this sort of a growing scene outside the courtroom with those who run to cameras doing that, as, as is wrote. Uh, Fox 29, our local station in Philadelphia, the great folks there whom we rely on for information have just told us that Victoria Valentine, one of the accusers, walked out of the courtroom just a moment ago and said, and I quote, we have a tsunami baby for the Me Too movement. She went on to say that she was surprised that the jury came back so quickly. Because they came back so quickly, she was preparing herself for a, mit for a mistrial and instead she said, there is justice at last. Uh, not surprisingly, Gloria Allred has found her way to the microphones. We're expecting to hear from, from players on the prosecution side in all of this. It's possible that we may see Bill Cosby at some point. If he's been, we, you know, we just, we just don't have a way of knowing exactly uh, where he, what his path will be. We heard Lisa Kaplan, our producer, say that he would be staying at his primary residence and that uh, his passport had been taken away. Lily Bernard is another of those uh, who said he, she was the victim of Bill Cosby. She said, and I quote, I feel like I'm, I'm dreaming. 
Can you pinch me? My faith in humanity is restored. This is a victory, not just for Pennsylvania, not just for Andrea Constand, a victory for all victims of sexual assault. And Lily Bernard went on to say, I thank the jury. Again, that from the reporting of our station Fox 29 in Philadelphia. Again, I, I, uh, Gloria Allred is speaking, and we'll get to all of that once the technical issues are worked out, and we hope that those are worked out presently. We, we don't, frankly, expect to hear from Bill Cosby, though I suppose anything is possible. He's remained extremely uh, closed-lipped during all of this. Uh, Lissa mentioned that, he, that she has been flanked, maybe Fox 29's feed, that she has been flanked. And let's listen, the audio's and fixed. We're very, very happy and proud of this result. Beginning in late 2014, we be the accusers of Mr. Cosby, whom I represented, began to speak out. It took a great deal of courage. In the beginning, many were not believed. We are so happy that finally we can say women are believed and not only on hashtag me too but in a court of law where they were under oath where they testified truthfully where they were attacked where they were smeared where they were denigrated where they there were attempts to discredit them and after all is said and done Women were finally believed, and we thank the jury so much for that. And they were believed after the prosecution met their high standard of having to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And the jury in this second criminal trial found that they believed women and I'm the happiest I have been about any court decision in 42 years. Shalon Lasha, who testified at this trial, states about the guilty verdict, I feel that the judicial system works. 32 years of nightmares and tears are over. Thanks to all of those who have supported me. Lee Slot Lublin, my client who testified at this trial as well, she's a teacher in Las Vegas, says, I am extremely grateful to see that the jury was able to see past his defense attorney's lies. And she says more. People would, all right. Uh, but people keep emailing me, so it's kind of covering up what they're saying. I truly hope that his long list of victims will truly, uh, will now be able to find some kind of peace. And we will have more from her a little bit later. And finally, we also have a statement from Janice Baker Kinney, who also testified at this trial. And, all right, there we go. Her statement is, I am overwhelmed with joy Relief and gratitude, joy that finally justice has been served, relief that the years of this toxic chain of silence has been broken, and we can now move forward with our, with our heads held high. And there will be more from her later. So I just want to say it's been a very long journey, but this is and her historic result. This was her story. Not his story, not history, but the story of her. The story of Andrea Constant. The story of all of those who took that risk against a rich, powerful, famous man. Took the risk of being denigrated publicly. Took the risk of being sued for what they said, because he had the resources to do it. Took the risk of being shamed and blamed as the defense did in their final argument. Took those risks and they took the risks so that their truth could be known, so that their truth could be believed. And yes, 
the Me Too a movement has arrived and is well and is living in Montgomery County throughout this nation and throughout this world. Thank you. Oh, lastly, I do want to thank Prosecutor Kevin Steele, Kristen Fedden, Stewart. The, An amazing the thank yous and the congratulations and the rest, and we'll hear from the victims if they speak. I want to I want to read for you uh, the writing of Jeremy Roebuck and Laura McChrystal, who are staff writers of the Philadelphia Inquirer and Daily News. Just one quick sentence, and I think it's a mighty good one. The verdict delivered the first celebrity conviction of the hashtag #MeToo era, in a case that in many ways stood at the vanguard. It stood at its vanguard and shone a spotlight on the role race, sexual entitlement, a scandal-hungry media, and Hollywood's casting couch culture played in the ruin of a comedic icon. Bill Cosby, guilty, 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 and in the penalty phase we'll learn if he'll ever be free again. Continuing now from the courthouse as we await from the victims. As well, but let's just have some questions first. Okay. All right. Thank you. Who would like to speak? Uh, you want to ask a question first? Or you want them to speak? I just want to thank uh, DA Steele and his amazing team and all of, of the people who believed in us every step of the way. We are so grateful to all of you and thank you, thank you, thank you. We are vindicated, we are validated, and we are now part of the tsunami of women's power and justice. We are not shutting up and we're not going away. Get over it. <laughs> thank you. I stand here in the spirit of Martin Luther King who said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but today it has bent towards justice. Last year, when I was sitting in the courtroom of the first trial and the verdict was hung, I left with such a tremendous sense of disappointment and it became evident to me that the justice system is light years behind modern culture. But today, this jury has shown that the Me Too, what the Me Too movement has saying is that women are worthy of being believed. And I thank the jury. I thank the prosecution. But I looked at that jury, there's this one young black man on that jury who I looked upon as my son, and I know the disappointment that he felt in looking at a beloved black male iconic father figure and being, being able to yet render a guilty verdict. I thank him. I thank all the juries, and this is a victory not just for Andrea Constant, whom I consider to be the Joan of Arc in the war on rape. It is not just a victory for the Commonwealth. It is not just a victory for the 62 of us publicly known Cosby survivors whom Gloria Allred has helped give a voice. It is also a victory for womanhood, and it is a victory for all sexual assault survivors, female and male. And I thank you all in the media. You are the pillars of democracy. Without you, none of this would have happened. Uh, so one last uh, point, which is, I said before the verdict, how many women does it take for one woman to be believed over the denial of one rich, powerful, famous man? And the answer in this case is four. All right, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you later. Attorney Gloria Allred and some of the victims of Bill Cosby. Rick Leventhal, our senior correspondent, reminds me, and it is certainly worth noting, Bill Cosby had hired a a very prestigious and high-priced defense attorney in Tom Mesereau to represent him. The same Tom Mesereau who represented Michael Jackson and achieved acquittals in Michael Jackson's cases so famously not that long ago. 
Uh, circumstances are different. I'm just pointing out that the lawyer is the same. Turning to uh, Caroline P Polisi now, who is a federal, a federal and white collar criminal defense attorney. Uh, this was a very tall order for a prosecutor. Uh, it, it was, but America's dad is going to prison finally. And I think, you know, you mentioned Tom Mesero. I think in a lot of ways, Mesero and his defense team were playing by sort of the old playbook prior to the Me Too movement. They went after all of these prior bad acts, character witnesses, um, really hard and, and, and really questioned sort of um, their motivations. And, and obviously question Andrea Constant's motivation as well. But we're in a time, we're in a moment where uh, we just are not going to choose to believe those kinds of attacks on women. So I think the fact that, you know, I think they called Janice Dickinson sort of a, a washed up starlet in, in their in their closing argument. That's not flying anymore. Post Me Too, um, that, that's not what we're, we're choosing to believe. We're choosing to believe the women. And this verdict is really a victory. It's historic, as Gloria Allred said. It is not a new tactic. It's been going on for decades and decades that on occasion, attorneys for the prosecution will attack the victim or the ones who claim to be the victim. And I wondered if you think this case, because of who the, who the assaulter is, what the, the high profileness of it all, that it might cause changes for prosecutors in courtrooms all across the nation. Uh, p potentially, I mean, I think there were there were a lot of really interesting decisions by Judge O'Neill in terms of the, the difference in evidence that he allowed in this from the first the first uh, mistrial, the, the trial that ended in a mistrial. He didn't let any of these other women come in to testify. He let one in, Kelly Johnson, but the second time around, he let in much more evidence. So we heard from other victims. Of course, this case went only to the issue of whether or not Cosby had committed this offense on the night in question against Andrea Constant. So the fact that they brought in other women to testify to his modus operandi, typically as a defense attorney, that's the kind of evidence that you fight tooth and nail to keep out of that courtroom because the, the argument goes it has nothing to do with the incident that occurred that night. Now, another really interesting uh, uh, ruling on the part of Judge O'Neill, he let in a confidant of Andrea Constant saying that she had confided in her, saying that she could extract money from a celebrity making up a false accusation. And a lot of us, you know, in the media, we thought maybe that was going to be sort of the nail in the coffin for the prosecution's case. It, it seemed like it was a little bit of a balancing act on the part of Judge O'Neill. Look, he let in these other women testify. Well, now he's going to let in sort of this sort of character assassination on Andrea Constant. Well, jury's not buying it. I'll have to say, we, we don't do this sort of speculation on air, but we certainly do like anyone else in the world would. You think about, oh, what does that mean? Well, this morning when they had the readback, and so yes. much of the testimony was about yeah, I was going to try to do something to some celebrity in order to make some money. You wonder then, wow, do they have a bunch of people who are, who are voting for acquittal? And there's one person who's saying, well, I think he might be guilty. And they're saying, look at what this, it wasn't that at all. Right. And that's why you cannot read into Right. what the readback is. Right. Well, as attorneys, we're, we're, we're always like waiting for that one whiff of a sort of reading the tea leaves in terms of a question that the jury, you know, asked the judge. And I think this readback was a really strong indication that maybe they were leaning towards an acquittal. Mm -hmm. Just goes to show you, not, not so. I mean, they came to a decision. Uh, this is Bill Cosby walking out live. Now, let's listen, see if we hear anything. <laughs> I know our Lisa Kaplan is there. I don't know if she's in that location or if she was able to hear whatever that was. Some of our viewers may have. I didn't. Lisa, did you hear it? Sorry, I'm, no, I just, I'm across the street. I, I'm across I just the street didn't know. The courthouse. Well, Sorry. The, the, no, no, it's all good. We, we, and, and we just so you know, we're, we, the, we just found out the DA is going to speak at, in soon. The district attorney will speak. Soon, yes. And I wonder if, you know, we, we've talked about a couple of things, Lisa, here. If I, I'm not saying that they are grounds for an appeal, that's certainly not for me to, to make judgment on. But I wonder if that district attorney might say these are avenues that we might pursue in an attempt to appeal. They, not really, right? The, the district attorney. You mean that? Happy. You mean that? Well, no, no, no. I, I, I meant the defense attorney. I said the defense district attorneys attorney. are definitely going to yeah. appeal this for um, sure. So. Go ahead, let's uh, Yeah, there seems like there were a lot of things that they were kind of asking or petitioning or putting on the record for appeal over the case of this trial. Live during, pictures, during Lisa, let's listen. Event.
And not a lot said there, uh, watching the floor as he walked. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I did. And now let's listen again. This is the, as he's exiting, let's listen. The view, the view now from Sky Fox as they're taking him, uh, uh, the, the helicopter of our station, uh, there in, in, in for the Philadelphia area, Fox 29. And I, Bill Cosby standing and holding what appeared to be a, a walking cane or something of that nature into the air. I, I'm not quite sure what that was. Lisa Kaplan, it, it looked like the the actions of a person who had been acquitted, not the actions of someone who might have been found guilty, but what do I know? Yeah, Cosby always kind of walked with that stick and kind of waved it back and forth as he was walking. So so raising that as a sort of gesture, a hello or something of that nature would be part of the routine? It seems to be. Um, they kind of have a, a, a system every day. Tom Mezzaro always walks past the camera and almost kind of averts his eyes as to not look at us as he's walking in or out of the courtroom every morning uh, for the past couple of weeks. Let's listen. And the fight is not over. Thank you. Uh, that's Tom Mezzaro. Let's listen. Yes, very strongly. Is Mr. Cosby prepared to go to prison? slowly getting into the back seat or into the car at least the back seat of an SUV to be taken away as an onlooker maybe a reporter I don't know screamed Mr. Cosby are you prepared to go to prison and that question that onlooker had asked repeatedly and during part of that uh, Bill Cosby held the the cane into the air whether the two are related uh, is for you to judge as you watch along with me but Certainly an, an, an extremely dramatic turn of events. Lisa, what was that like from the crowd as you as you watched when he came out the door? I mean, it was just mayhem. You saw a bunch of reporters just go. There's, if you're looking at the courthouse, there's a number of steps up to the courthouse. And then if you look kind of to the left, there's a pathway that Cosby walks down. And then there's kind of a drop off from from that walkway to the, the sidewalk. The reporters just kind of went running from the steps down the pathway to kind of get to that car position and jump over the wall. It just was, I mean, nuts. Uh, I don't know how to else to describe it except for that. We, we, you know, there were there were so many people, not not here, but there at your location, about whom I've been reading. Some of the people who claim to be victims of Bill Cosby, other courtroom observers who said when they learned just, what, an hour and a half ago that a verdict had been reached, they thought in the grand scheme of things it was such a short period of time that many had prepared themselves for, for an acquittal here. Yeah, I think so. And I don't you know, think anyone knew what to think. And also to add, the, the officers who had been sent home had been sent back to the hotel earlier in the day and hadn't been part of the deliberation since the start. They sat through the whole trial, but were not part of the deliberation. They were let in just before, you know, just before the, the 12 jurors who deliberated were brought in. So they were there um, and were able to witness it as well. But those women who are who have accused Cosby, they were there. It was very emotional for them. You could tell that they were they were waiting for the verdict. They were they were emotional. They were talking amongst each other and just the anticipation really seemed to be getting to them. And, and like I said before, they just kind of burst into tears and had to be escorted out of the courtroom. Um, it all seems to be a bit too much for them. Rick Leventhal reminds there's been a, always a small crowd of supporters outside. 
insisting that Bill Cosby had been railroaded. But lately, Lisa, and tell me your experiences on this, the hashtag Me Too supporters had been there. And many of our viewers may have heard or seen online or here on Fox News that one of them recently took her top off and charged at him a couple of weeks ago. It has been a dramatic and emotional trial. It definitely has. That was one of the first couple of days of trial. The woman just jumps over the barricades and was kind of tackled into the bush by some of the court officers here. Um, there have been people all hours of the night or all during the day kind of with signs and protesting. But there's also been some supporters here, too, 